Amen. Oh, it is so good to be in the presence of the Lord today. Amen. I hope you came ready to worship, because if you didn't, you missed a good part. I hope you came ready to receive the Word of God today. Amen. 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 <laughs> Ronnie, it was quiet in here, wasn't it, there, just for a second there, I think. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, <clears throat> I want to talk to us about a subject today that all of humanity has had to deal with. All of humanity. From Adam and Eve to April the 30th, 2023, everybody, every human being has had to answer this question, deal with this question, respond to this question. Everybody. And it is simply, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? It doesn't matter to you what I do to, with Jesus. The question that you must ask yourself is, what will you do with Jesus? Because what I do with him won't get you into heaven or keep you out. It won't get you into hell or keep you out. It is what you do with Jesus that's going to matter. So I pose the question, what are you going to do with Jesus? Pharaoh and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Pilate and the Sanhedrin court, people gathered in the upper room, the disciples, and the list goes on and on, had to answer that question. What do I do with Jesus? You ever thought about it that way? At some point in time, the disciples had to make a decision. What am I going to do about Jesus? This Jesus that I heard of, this Je am I going to follow him or, or am I going to reject him? Even the disciples. We know that Pilate wanted to wring his hands of this man called Jesus. He said, I find no fault in him, but I don't want to do anything with him. You do something with him. And then the rulers, of the Jewish rulers, said, I don't want to do anything with him. You do it. You're the king. But they actually had to answer the question, what am I going to do with Jesus? You've got to answer that question today. What are you going to do with Jesus? You say, well, I've already accepted Jesus Christ in my life. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. What are you going to do with Jesus then? Where is he at in your life? What will you do with Jesus once you accept him? Do you put him on a shelf? Do you think about him on Sundays? Is that the first time he comes across? Well, let's see. Well, no, we got church on Sunday. What are you going to do with Jesus? It's a question that you, uh, you will answer. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I will or not. Oh, you will. The Bible tells me that one day every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that he is Lord and that if you don't do that, you will be sent to an eternal damnation called hell. He didn't send you there. It's because you reject him, because you decided not to do anything with Jesus. Oh, you're going to have to decide what are you going to do with Jesus. I hope you're getting the message today. You're going to have to do something about Jesus. There's only two things that you can do with Jesus. Everything can kind of be summed up in these two areas. Two things, if you're taking notes. You can reject him or you can embrace him. There is no in-between with God. You can reject him or you can embrace him. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, I have a bunch of scriptures, no main text this morning. I guess I'll just say my main text is the Bible. Just from the beginning to the end, you got to deal with Jesus. What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with Jesus? You ever had that person come in your life and they were just that person that worried you and they, they nipped at you like that little nipping dog? They just, oh, and you say, what am I going to do about this person? 
and they just and finally they just go away. Either you pray that they die or whatever, but they go away. Amen. Come on. You ever had that problem that was real big in your life and you said, what are we going to do? You went to your honey and said, honey, what are we going to do about these finances? What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about, what are we going to do about this child? Come on. You have to deal with it though. Well, that's nothing compared to what you got to do with Jesus. You got to deal with Jesus. Revelation 3.15 says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. Now, I would wish that you were hot, you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, that's the in-between. You're lukewarm. And neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you refuse to do something with Jesus. When you reject Jesus, when you refuse to deal with Jesus, he deals with you. He says, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you. That word vomit means to spew as a projectile. What are you going to do with Jesus? you got to do something with him. You're going to have to do something with Jesus. You'll either do something with him today or you'll do something with him when you meet him. But you will do something with Jesus. You can also say that as a Christian that I've accepted Christ in my life. And I'm just going through the motions. I believe Revelation 3 talks about that lukewarm Christian. I believe that's what it's talking to. I know it is. If you're just lukewarm in there. He says, I wish you was one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, you're in a place where, where nothing's coming from you. You're not producing good fruit. You're, not, you're just there. You're going through this motion called life, and you show up on church because you think that's something you ought to do. Well, you should do that. The Bible instructs us to do so in Hebrews 10. To forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. As the manner is of some as such, even as the day approaches. That's just a byproduct of you being saved is you wanting to come to church. Byproduct of being saved is I want to worship Jesus. I, I want to do things for the kingdom. That's a byproduct of salvation. But what are you going to do with Jesus if you're lukewarm? What are you doing with him if you're lukewarm? Is he on the shelf somewhere? Is he only a God that we pray to when we have a great need in our life? That we need more money? We need a healing? We need to fix a problem? Is, he that, is that what he is to you? Oh, he can be that to you, but he's much bigger than that. What are you going to do with Jesus? Matthew speaks of a gate and a narrow path and a narrow way that leads to heaven. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke says to strive for the narrow gate. That leads to heaven. What are you going to do with Jesus today? David, the psalmist, David in Psalms 16 and 11 says that there is a path of life that leads to heaven. So now we have a gate. We have a narrow way. We have a, another gate that leads to heaven. We have a path that leads to heaven. And Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah says that there is a highway of holiness that leads to heaven. What are you going to do with Jesus? Matthew seven thirteen through 14 says this. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide, everybody say wide, is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in by that way. Verse 14 says this, because narrow, listen to what these words of, of, the, of the writer, uh, there is, <clears throat> because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. I wrote in my notes that if there is no difficulty in your Christian walk, in your life, as you are following Christ, you just might be standing at the wrong gate. 
Think about that. He says to follow Christ will be difficult. And if everything in your life is smooth sailing, you might be staring at the wrong gate. It's going to be difficult. I've never preached in this house that you would be a better roses when you come to Christ. You'll fight tooth and nail. You'll fight for every inch of ground that you're going to take as a spiritual, as a Christian. You'll fight for, you'll fight for your marriage. You'll fight for your kids. You'll fight to come to church. You'll fight to worship God. You'll fight to pay your tithes. You'll fight for every inch of ground that you're going to take. What are you going to do with Jesus? The Bible says it's difficult. It's difficult. Don't give up. What are you going to do with him? You're going to discard him in the middle of the stream? Are you going to discard him when, when things get a little tough and you say, Well, where is God? I've seen too many people shake their fist at God and say, Where are you at, God? You can only imagine God sitting in his heavenly throne saying, I never said it would be easy, son or daughter. I never said that you would have no difficulties. I said it would be difficult. But if you'll stand fast in the word of God, get your feet planted on the rock that will stay. Get your feet out of the miry clay. You can make it if you decide, this is what I'm going to do with Jesus. I'm going to follow him no matter what. I'm going to follow him. What are you going to do with Jesus? You got to make up your mind today. Isaiah 35 speaks of this highway of holiness. You find it in the latter part of it's like verse 9, 10, 11. We won't read it this morning. You go do your homework on it. Isaiah 35 speaks of this highway of holiness that only the redeemed, listen to me because I'm going to make a point, that only the redeemed will walk on. There's this highway of holiness that if you're not trying to be holy, if you're not surrendered to Christ, you don't get to walk on this highway. It's a highway of holiness that Scripture says only the redeemed, blood-bought, born-again, child of God, get to walk on this highway. You can want to, but you can't. It also says of this, that the evil person, you go read it this afternoon, that the evil person or the sinful person couldn't even stumble across it if they wanted to. You can't get on this as a, as a halfway Christian because there are no such things as halfway Christians. Come on, somebody. You either are a Christ follower or you're not. You'd be vomited, spewed. From his mouth. This Isaiah the prophet speaks of this highway of holiness that the redeemed will dance and rejoice as they enter into Zion. This is a somewhat of a metaphor of us entering to heaven and also of the children of Israel going back to, uh, going back to uh, the city of uh, David after the Babylonian captivity. But we, we, you should be dancing and rejoicing and grateful as you enter into Zion. You're not there yet. You're, if you're here in this room, you're not in heaven yet. But while you're here, you ought to be rejoicing that God has saved you. You ought to be dancing that God has set you free and delivered you from bondage and from addictions and from those chains that bind us, from the weight of sin. We should be rejoicing about that. That's why the world's not excited about coming to church. That's why the church is not excited about coming to the church. Nobody's excited about what God did for them. Nobody rejoices that God set me free. God, nobody does, uh, rejoices that God has set you up on a, a rock to stay. Nobody rejoices. They just think God's somewhere out there and I've got my fire insurance card. I don't want to go to hell. Is that what you want to do with Jesus today? Jesus, I just don't want to go to hell. That's all I want, Jesus. I just don't want to. Let me live my life the way I want to live it. Let me indulge in the fleshly desires. Let me, let me get into drunkenness and addiction and fornication and adultery and thievery and jealousy and envy and lying and malice and strife and dissension in the church and in the world. Let me get into that, Lord. But I just don't want to go to hell. Well, you're just like everybody else. Nobody wants to go to hell. I've never asked one person in my life, and I've asked a lot of people about Jesus, 
Do you want to go to hell? Nobody ever says, yeah, sign me up. You going tonight? I'd like to go today. Never, I've never asked anybody, and they told me that. That would be foolish. What are you going to do with Jesus? It says the redeemed will dance and rejoice as they enter into Zion. I want to tell you this, that there is no ditch that leads to heaven. There is no other way that leads to heaven. You can't get there any other way than a, a narrow gate, a righteous path, a highway to, of holiness is the only way you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can't get there any other way. Why do we want to make up our own method to get there? I'm telling you, you got to do something with Jesus. And you better do the right thing with Jesus. Because if you don't, Eternity for you will be a hell, a literal hell. The Bible speaks of a hell that is prepared for, his, for the devil and his angels, not for us. But if you reject Christ, you will go to hell for eternity. Some of you are new. I'll tell you my story. Eternity is like this. It's if one sparrow went to the east coast of the United States, picked up one grain of sand, flew all the way to the west coast and dropped it off and did that one grain of sand at a time until all of the sand on the east coast was transported to the west coast. Eternity would have just started. It's going to be a while. I think we might want to answer the question today, what am I going to do with Jesus? Because once you step across from this life to that life, there are no redos. There are no second chances. You don't get to start over. Now is the time. Today, starting to, is the dress rehearsal for heaven. It's something for us to think about. It's something for you to think about. Because if you're going to answer this question, Pastor, I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it. You, don't, you can just do away with the question. But you're going to deal with Jesus. I love you. John 10, 1 says this. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And we know that Scripture tells us that thieves and robbers do not enter into heaven. What he's saying in this passage of Scripture that his sheep, they know the voice of the shepherd and they come the proper way. There's only one way through the sheep gate and that's through the gate. You can't climb up another way. There's no other, there's no other religion that, that's correct that says there is another way. If it, they said there's another way other than being blood-bought, born again, child of God, giving your heart to life, it is false. There's one way. And it must be through the blood of Jesus Christ. It must be through the forgiveness of sins that you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and you repent of your sins and you turn from your wicked ways and you follow Christ. You give him your heart. What will you do with Jesus? Hallelujah. If you reject him, Matthew 25 I'll read verse 46, but there's 31 through 46. You can read all of that at home. And these will go into, away into everlasting punishment. Who are these? These that reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. These that take the question, what am I going to do with Jesus, and say, I'm not going to do anything with him. I'm going to reject him. See, you not doing something with Jesus means you automatically reject him. But the righteous into eternal life. On that highway of holiness, on that righteous path, standing at the narrow gate where the way may be difficult, but you enter in that gate 
you will enter in into eternal life with Christ Jesus. Matthew 7, 21 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There's more to this thing than you just coming down and having a little pamby and be prayer and saying, Lord, come into my heart and I want to be saved. There's some commandments. There's some things that you've got to start doing the will of God. That means you've got to put your will down and pick up his will for your life and start doing that. Amen, somebody. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wondrous wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. Sin separates us from God. Church, there's more to this thing than a showing up on Sunday or on a Wednesday and holding hands and singing Kumbaya and saying Jesus is always going to be with me and everything's going to be fine and dandy. Everything's going to be good because I love Jesus. Well, I'm here to declare to you today that I've loved Jesus for a long time and it's not always been fun and easy in my life. But I can tell you this, that I've never awakened in the morning. I've never went to sleep at night. I've never been awakened by the Holy Spirit in the middle of the night. That God wasn't there with me. That God wasn't there saying, you got this, son. You keep plowing. You keep going. Keep following me and you're going to make it. I've never been forsaken by the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because God's word is true. And he says, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake. Come on, somebody. If you embrace him, Acts chapter 2, verse 21 says it this way. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that passage of Scripture. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's hope for you today. If you are a whoever, there is hope for you today. God has not vacated his position as king of kings and lord of lord. He hasn't vacated his and given up his authority as being the savior of the world. He can save you if you repent. If you confess that he is Lord, you can be saved today. Amen. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, I love that word, shall. My daddy never used shall very much, but I can just imagine if he used shall, that means it's fixing to happen, son. Most of the time it would have been in this context. Son, you shall take out the trash, or I shall. You can fill in the blank, come on. That word just has different meaning to me. Shall. John chapter 3, verse 15. We didn't even go to go 16 because this says it as well. 3.15 says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What are you going to do with Jesus? If you don't accept him, you don't have eternal life. What will you do with Jesus? Lee, will you come to the piano? I know y'all are shocked a little early, but I ain't finished yet. Needs of the Holy Ghost. Acts 16, 31 says this. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What that context is where Paul and Silas, they were in the jail. And the earthquake came and and the jailer was scared. Do you remember the story? The jailer was scared that all the prisoners had run off and all the shackles had been released from their hands and their feet and the door swung open and the jailer was about to, the Philippian jailer was about to throw himself on his own uh, spear, if you will, kill himself. And old Paul said, hey, don't fear. We're, We're all still here. We hadn't went anywhere. And then this Philippian jailer raises this question. It's what he said. What must I do to be saved? And they said, Paul and Silas, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
you and your household. I couldn't, I can't get saved for my kids. But I'm telling you what, if you get on fire for Jesus, you let Jesus get in your heart. There ought to be something in your life that, that your children can look at while they're living at home and say, something's different in my daddy. Something's different in my mama. Something's different going on in my life. I feel something that I never felt in my bedroom when I lay down. I feel something called my daddy's been praying and my mama's been praying and we're going to church more. I feel something different. And I'm telling you, if you get a true relationship, get in love with God and get on fire for God, your kids will follow you. Pastor, I don't know about that. Well, they follow you to everything else you do. Why won't they follow you to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Jesus wants your children to be saved. Jesus wants your children. He wants to raise them up to be the next prophets and be the next evangelists and the next pastors and the next preachers and the next teachers. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your family. Preacher, you don't even know my family. We argued all the way to church. Praise God, that's why me and my wife don't ride the same vehicle, so we won't argue. Come on, you got to do things. Outsmart the devil, come on. <laughs> Glory to God. Look, I'm not some super spiritual guy. I, I, I get up every morning just like you do. Sometimes I have issues like every day. But I decided a long time ago, no matter what's coming down the pipe at my house, no, what's com- no matter what's coming tomorrow that I may know of, I won't leave him. I'm in the long haul with him. He didn't leave me. I ain't got any right to leave him. He's my only hope, church. He's your only hope. If you put your hope in him and your trust and faith in him, he'll see you through. But he's your hope. He's your hope. Not your bank account. Not your wife. Not your husband. Not your mom and your daddy. Not your job. Not your health insurance. He is our living hope. Put your hope in him. What are you going to do with Jesus today? He'll set you free. He'll set you free. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And whom the Son, John says, whom the Son sets free is free. Not only free, but free indeed. In other words, he seals it. You are free. If you put your trust in Jesus, what are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him, church? What are you going to do with Jesus? You need to be praying for your kids. What are you going to do? If you got grandkids, what are you going to do? What are they going to do with Jesus? What are they going to do with Jesus when they get up in the morning? What are they going to do about him when they get faced and sitting in the back seat of a car with a young boy or a young man? What are they going to do with Jesus? Are they going, are they going to say, I reject Jesus and, and let something happen in the back seat of a car on date on Friday night? Or are they going to say, oh, I'm standing with Jesus. I'm not going to leave Jesus. I'm in the wrong spot at the wrong time. I've got to go. Are they going to be able to call you up and say, Daddy, Something's about to happen. I need you to come get me. Oh, my God. Why do we allow our children to be in places like that? I'll tell you why. Because we don't value God. We say, God's somewhere over here. And if he decides to do this, he will. But we have power in prayer. Pray for your babies. Pray that they'll see and come to know Jesus early on. I prayed for the... My kids and grandkids, more my grandkids than my kids. I feel like I could beat my own kids, but these grandkids, it's a little different. I beat Jesus into them. I've been praying for all my grandchildren. God, let them love you more than anything or anybody in this world. Because see, if we get that right, if we can get our children in love with Jesus more than anything or any person, we don't have to worry about them because Jesus has got them. They're in love with the the Savior. They're in love with the Father. They're in love with the Holy Spirit. That's why we're having trouble with our families. Come on, church. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? You going to choose to follow him today? You going to say, well, I already follow him. Do you know you can never exploit God 
in your life. You can never get to the pinnacle, the top of what he wants you to do in your life. And I think that's what we think. We think so many times we get saved and we say, well, I've done, I've done all. I, I, I praise God, I've done reach the pinnacle. That is such a lie from the devil. That is such a lie from the pit of hell. Once you get saved, you ought to be working like a madman trying to get somebody else saved. Come on. It ought to be in our heart that Jesus saved me and you know what he brought you from. Just for a second. Just think back where Jesus brought you from. Just, just for a second. We ain't gonna do that. Just you know where he brought you from. Do you want to go back? Wouldn't it be awesome? Because you're not the only one that went through what you went through. You may think you're the only one, but no, there's millions of you all around the world. Millions of people just like me that go through this. Wouldn't it be awesome if we took what we know God done for us and gave it to others? Say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? I pray the convicting power of the Holy Spirit just sweeps through this room right now. Just burns every heart right now. Just burns every mind right now. Pastor, you don't know where I've been. No, sir. No, ma'am, I do not know where you've been. Let me put a little P.S. in there. Nor do I care. And I'm going to speak for this body. Nor does this body call LVA Church care. What we care about is how we can help you from this point in your life when you decide what you're going to do with Jesus and we're going to help you move forward. But what you've done in your past, I cannot change, nor can you. You didn't lose your memory when you got saved. Some of you got to thinking about some of them places and some of them people and some of them things you was doing before you got saved. You didn't lose your memory. What you lost was your sin debt. What you lost was that bondage. What you lost was that oppression and depression. What you lost was that hold that the devil had on you. That's what you lost. But what you gained was freedom and expression to worship the living God. That's what you got. Hallelujah. What are you going to do with Jesus? If you've denied him like Peter, probably all of us have at one point in our lives. If you've doubted him like Thomas, if you've betrayed him like Judas, hear me, you can still embrace him like Mary at the foot of his feet, washing his feet with the very possessions that you own. She gave him everything. She gave him the possessions that she had. She gave him, watch this, her time. To sit at Jesus' feet and weep over his feet and wipe his feet with her hair. She brought what she had because she decided she was going to do something with Jesus. You have something to bring to Jesus. I love this story because it's not about anything. It's not about bringing possessions. It's not about you were in a high place. It was about a lowly woman who was believed to be a harlot. And she said, I'll bring what I have to Jesus. I'll bring my brokenness. I'll bring my sin. I'll bring my shame. I'll bring my condemnation. I'll bring every addiction that I had to sleeping with men or whatever it is. I'll bring it and I'll give it to him. And he'll just, I got it. Nailed it to the cross. Remember the woman at the well? caught in the very act of adultery. Now, I don't know about you, but if you caught in the very act, 
That means you got caught in the very act. It's what the Bible says. And remember all those religious people, and if you're in here, I pray you repent to the Lord right now. All those religious people that wanted to cast a stone at the woman. Y'all remember the story? They bring her in front of Jesus, trying to trap Jesus. Oh, my God. See, what I love about this, that in the middle of trying to trap Jesus, he still sets people free. They bring him and say, bring this woman and say, Jesus, what do you think about this? She was caught in very act. What does the law say? Oh, he doesn't back up from the law. I love the way he spins it, though. They said, the law says she ought to be stoned. He's uh-huh. He talks about the sin. Jesus said, well, well, that's fine. But which of you is without sin? Cast the first stone. Love the story. One by one, the accusers begin to leave. I can only imagine that the woman was just in shame with her head down in front of Jesus. And Jesus even had to get her attention and say, Woman, where are your accusers? I don't see any. Praise God. Well, neither do I accuse you. Come on, there's something that gets me worked up about that verse because I was a sinner and I've been saved by grace by his mercy he saved us what are you going to do with Jesus what are you going to do with Jesus don't be at the wrong gate Don't be standing at the wrong gate waiting for that gate to open up. Enter into that narrow gate. Don't be standing in the ditch. They don't name ditches. They name highways. They name roads to get you to a place. No one's ever told me, go get in this ditch and you'll get to Little Rock. Go get in this ditch and it'll take you to New Orleans. No, they don't say that. They say, go get on this highway. Get on this path. Take this road. You'll get there. You know what dishes are designed to do? Carry stuff away from the road. Ever so often, you'll see a a ditch and you'll see a turnout. And it'll go to a bigger ditch. And that bigger ditch takes it to that water to another bigger ditch. And And it'll end up in the Mississippi River if you're on this side of the United States. It'll end up there. It's diverting stuff from the highway. The ditch is not where you want to be just scuttling along thinking it's fun. you got to get on the highway. The Bible says this about a ditch if you're wondering. The Bible says that if the blind lead the blind, do they both fall in the ditch? If it was a good place, he would say, I want all the blind to lead the blind and they'll fall on the highway of holiness. Ditch is not where you want to be. You want to be at the narrow gate, on the narrow path that leads to eternal life, that leads to everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And hear me out, there will be bumps along the way. Some of you will get saved, and I'm going to close. Some of you will get saved. Listen to me. Some of you are going to get saved. You're going to give your heart to the Lord. And there's going to be a difference. Going to be a a chasm, if you will, between you and your spouse. It happens. I see it. Because once saved, and I said, I don't want to be saved. Well, the reason I don't come, because my wife don't come, my husband don't come. Get up, come without them. Come on, somebody. You get them come to church, and you get them, you love Jesus, you get them read your Bible. I don't care what they say, you get them do that. 
Because you're going to be accountable for you. You're not accountable for them and they're not accountable for you. Don't let somebody drag you to hell. Don't let your kids, because they heathens, keep you from coming to church. Grab them up. Bring them in. Set them down on there. Tell them you'll kill them. Tell God they died if they don't act right in church. Come on, somebody. Bible says I'm supposed to train the child. The child ain't supposed to train me. We got that backwards today, by the way. I had a parent one time tell me, well, I can't go out deep because little Johnny's so bad. Little Johnny got some options. Straighten up, get whooped. I'm talking about southern whooped. I know there's different methods, and praise God. They all, those other methods work. I, I'm, not, I'm just telling you one works. Ask my son and my daughter. They work. That precious little sweetheart you see singing up here, she got whooped when she was at home. Then she had to decide what I'm going to do with Jesus. It's okay to have fun in church because you still got to answer the question, what you going to do with Jesus? What you going to do with Jesus? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you'll stand with me across this building. Oh, come on, somebody. I need you to pray. I feel the Holy Spirit in this house that's drawing people. You know, no one comes to the Father unless he be drawn. Unless he's drawn by the Spirit. Nobody. Oh, how I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would draw somebody today. And then I prayed that right after that, Lord, when you're drawing them. Let them yield. Let them yield to the drawing of the Holy Spirit because you have that free will that says you don't have to come. You don't have to do anything with Jesus. You don't have to do anything with Him today, but you're going to. If you haven't made up your mind in this building, if you've never, maybe you have a hundred times over, You've made up your mind or you've said, I, I, I want to live for the Lord. But, but somewhere along this way, you've, you've fallen off track. You've, your, your, your spiritual train has derailed. Say, I need, I need Jesus. Oh, I need Jesus in a way that I've never, I never needed Him before. That's you. I want you to come, come to this front. The Bible says that if you... Deny me before men, I'll deny you before Christ, before God. Make a public confession and be serious. We're not judging you. We've all made that walk down this altar, down this way. We've all knelt and given our sins to Jesus. If that's you, will you come? Pastor, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know about coming to the front. Come to the front. Jesus is in the back where you are, but he's also, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you that you would accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That you'd be on fire for God. That you'd change your ways. There'd be true repentance in your heart. Is that you? Will you come? What are you going to do with Jesus? Oh, you're going to have to do something with Him. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Him, church? Sir, ma'am, what are you going to do with Jesus? It's better today to decide you're going to follow Him than reject Him. It's better today to say, I'm going to embrace my Savior than it is stand before Him and hear these words, Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Is that you today? Will you come? Come on, saints, I need you praying that the power of the Holy Spirit would draw them men, women, and children today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the lost are drawn today in this service. Today, right now, Lord. Lord, that the yielding of the fleshly will 
to the things of God would take place right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we'd settle the question, what am I going to do with Jesus? We can leave and say, I know what I've done with Jesus. I know what I've done. I've made him my Savior. I've made him my King. I've made him my Lord. I've made him my Master. I'm going to serve him. I need some people praying with me right up here. You say, Pastor, I'm scared. Well, grab that person by the hand and stand next to you and come up here. The Bible wants you to be fearful. The Bible says that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, which is being scared, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Brother R.T., can you come up here and help me pray? Father, in the name of Jesus.